Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Tenant Talks. We're now on to our sixth episode of this new weekly web series that we launched here at Cove. Uh, each week, we sit down with a new member of the Cove community and uh, learn more about their products and projects. This is a special week as we're now in the middle of Oceans Week here in Halifax. Uh, Monday was World Oceans Day, and we're proud to support the initiatives uh, to help uh, improve the health of our ocean. Uh, because it's a special week, uh, we're expanding Tenant Talks, and today we feature a double header with two exciting guests from the Cove community. Uh, of note, before I introduce our guests, I want to get some housekeeping items out of the way. Uh, feel free at any point to jump into the chat and the Q&A sections, which is the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can ask questions. I will relay them to Mark, and uh, we'll get those answered live on air. Uh, in between guests, we'll also have some trivia. I'll be giving away uh, some, some Cove swag, uh, some merchandise, very nice reusable bottle to cut down on uh, plastic bottles, very uh, pertinent to uh, Oceans Week. Uh, and moving on now, I'm really excited to chat with, with our guest. I'm going to jump right in and introduce, introduce Mark. He's the head of business development at Pro Oceana Systems. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Kyle. and Welcome, everyone. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for joining, Mark. It's great to see you again. I uh, ha haven't seen you in a few months, so this is a, this is a good way to catch up. Um, uh, you, you've been with Pro Oceanus for a long time now. Um, can you give us uh, some information uh, on your background, your path that led you to Pro, Oce Pro Oceanus? Absolutely. So, uh, yes, I've uh, been with Pro Oceanus for it will be eight years next month. Uh, and so my path started uh, as a Dell, Dell graduate, undergrad, and uh, ended up uh, sort of sneaking into a PhD program in the oceanography department. And uh, Bruce, uh, the co-owner of Pro Oceana Systems, was one of my uh, co-advisors during my thesis period there. And so uh, sort of actually worked on developing, you know, underwater equipment for looking at sediment mechanics. So developing particular sensors to look at fracture of muds. Uh, and this had uh, various applications, but we were sort of looking at it more on gas bubbles and how they rise and are, are more or less transport themselves through sediment, uh, whether it's you know near surface or, or at depth. And so uh, once that finished up, uh, there was an opportunity to, to come work with Bruce once again at Pro Oceana Systems as a industrial research postdoctoral fellowship program and uh, more or less went from research development uh, on this side to uh, sort of taking over some of the sales when we went through some some challenging times and changes uh, and slowly moved my way more towards the business development. Uh, so I still do a fair bit of R&D with the company, uh, but certainly do a lot more on business development and relationship building at this point. Oh, that's very exciting. The, there's, there's probably an interesting intersect between uh, the business and the, the, the research and development side, especially as you're talking to customers, better understanding their needs. You kind of have a, a good mindset to be able to develop those products uh, based on their needs. Absolutely. I said, I just love the, to have those sort of conversations with people when they have an idea and they may not necessarily know how to get to that end point. Uh, sort of coming from my background and be able to think about things analytically uh, as well as engineering wise to try and understand what, what we're capable of as a company and what their requirements are and, and how we can, you know, make a fit. And a lot of cases that will be on the fly. And so, uh, you know, it certainly can happen in a five or 10 minute conversation where all of a sudden we end up with uh, a project uh, that we can sort of move forward on and go to that next stage. That's exciting. So uh, you, you met Bruce very early on. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the history of the company, how things got started, and uh, and we can jump in maybe after that to some of the products and stuff you're building now. Absolutely. So Proceanus, more or less, uh, it formed a, as a company or was incorporated 21 years ago now, uh, based at a research at Dalhousie University, where Bruce was uh, a associate professor for a very long time, more than 30 years. Uh, and working with one of his students, uh, they were trying to understand how air sea, uh, how gases transfer from the air to the ocean surface. And this would be trying to understand, you know, exchange with the atmosphere and how the oceans actually react. Uh, and this is quite pertinent in a lot of cases, especially when you look at climate change and look at carbon and carbon dioxide and how that's either taken up by the ocean or released. And so uh, 
uh, came up with a sensor for measuring gas pressure, dissolved gas pressure in the ocean surface. And uh, once they published the paper, uh, he had emails and phone calls coming in from other researchers around the globe saying, I want this product. I don't care what it costs. Uh, and at that point, he realized it was probably a time to incorporate. And, uh, you know, for the next 10 years after that, you know, he remained as a, mainly as an associate professor, uh, but had some support and uh, helped to grow the company actually out of the biotech center uh, on the Halifax waterfront for a number of years before deciding to move our facility to Bridgewater. Uh, and this was based on where our general manager who had been traveling day in and day out from Bridgewater area to Halifax and realizing that we sell globally. We don't need to be in Halifax. You know, at the end of the day, internet connection is what we really need to be able to connect ourselves and plug into the world. Uh, and as a result over the last 20 years now, we've grown from that sort of small seed and idea at Dalhousie to, you know, a company of 14 people now. Nice. That has been an interesting tra trajectory for sure. Um, and then if you need to be in Halifax, you can uh, use your space here at Cove uh, for meetings and different things. Absolutely. No, the Cove has been tremendous. <laughs> the free plug there for sure. Yeah, it's been a great support for us. And uh, <laughs> it does plug us into the ocean tech community, which has grown uh, so substantially in the last 20 years in Halifax. So that, uh, you know, being in Bridgewater does isolate us a little bit. So being able to be a part of that Cove community does allow a lot more relationship building and just, you know, to be plugged in, as you say. Perfect. So uh, I'm sure people are getting very uh, anxious to learn more about uh, some of the products you guys are building. Maybe we can jump into that presentation that you have queued up and uh, we can get started from there. Sure. So I'll just share my screen here and Perfect. Right, Looks so, great. All right. So thanks, Kyle. And, uh, so I said, we'll just sort of run through, shouldn't be more than about 10 minutes just to go through some of the products and, and a few of the applications and things that we're doing here at ProOceanus. And I guess I should make clear, it is pronounced ProOceanus. Uh, we do get that question a lot. Uh, so first and foremost, I wanna point out where we're located. Uh, we're located in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. It's about an hour outside of Halifax, a wonderful, community of about 8,000 people. Uh, we're just up off the river area and we're in a 19th century, sorry, 18th century courthouse. Uh, wonderfully built building, a lot of original woodwork still exists in here today. Uh, and it really is just a cool place to call home. And it's been dubbed uh, Oceanus House uh, uh, since, since it was purchased. Uh, unlike a lot of companies, who, you know, maybe we're looking at ocean tech and focus on oceanography. That's where certainly the core of Pro Oceanus has been as far as markets for a long time. Uh, but as a niche company that, that certainly, you know, has focused on a, just several products, uh, we've branched out into uh, quite a broad range, being one of only less than a handful of companies in the world that produce what we do. Uh, so now we've branched into areas like limnology and freshwater coastal and estuary. We also have been into wastewater and groundwater monitoring markets uh, and a lot more so lately markets such as aquaculture uh, and algae products, but also some of the more traditional oil and gas and, you know, as well as carbon capture storage. So as I said, Pro Oceanus was developed out of R&D and that continues to be the heart of Pro Oceanus and, and what we do here. Uh, this is something that uh, we strive to be able to do and what it does that it actually helps us grow by, you know, thinking outside of the box to help develop new, new products that will help solve problems that can't be solved otherwise. Uh, so just three examples here. Uh, one, we were able to produce a, well, it's a control system for CO2 in very large seawater tanks. And this is a world renowned facility in Heron Island uh, at the University of Queensland in Australia. And so they're doing tons of important research here on ocean acidification, how this will affect organisms in the ocean uh, as far as what current levels are in the ocean, as well as what we're predicting based on a number of different uh, 
models that are out there. Uh, so this system has been able to control their CO2 levels in their ecosystem tanks to an extremely high precision and accuracy for the last 10 years now. Uh, in the middle, this was a more recent application where we worked with uh, Doug Wallace's group uh, at Dalhousie University on the development of, uh, of an improved flow through CO2, uh, dissolved CO2 sensor for shipboard use. The real concern with most sensors traditionally have been very low water flow rates in order to ensure that sensors are not damaged. Uh, this system, which was developed by Andera, a uh, xylem company uh, can flow water up to 30 liters and I think even more per minute. And what this allows for is instantaneous real-time uh, measurements of surface ocean parameters without time lag. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to doing that. Uh, now one of the drawbacks was limitations on some of the sensors. So we worked very, very hard with them uh, to make changes to our sensors to be able to tolerate that. Uh, and that's been a very successful project that's been going on. Uh, one of the other ones I just want to touch on is uh, almost one of our, I guess, flagship sensors now is our CO2 Pro Atmosphere Sensor. So this measure, this sensor actually measures both seawater CO2 and atmosphere CO2 to look at CO2 flux. Uh, and this came out of uh, you know request at the end of the day, uh, and so that's that's become one of our most popular products as a result of one researcher sort of looking to, to have this measurement. So as a result of being a niche company where we focus on measuring a few parameters and measuring them extremely well, uh, these would be dissolved carbon dioxide, methane, as well as total dissolved gas pressure. Uh, and by doing that, our focus has not necessarily been to focus on a single market, but to focus on these products and how we can make them work for multiple markets. Uh, and as a result, we have three different lines of sensors. So we have a pro series, which are really that top of the line, high accuracy, long stability, long-term stability sensors. Uh, and really does, you know, is where we started and, and, and why we have, you know, our tagline of stability to see a change, which, uh, uh, seems to be even more pertinent in a time like we have right now. Uh, when, as a result of you know, downturns in economies, we pivoted a number of years ago and, and developed a mini series. And these were designed to, to sort of break into some other markets, uh, including ROVs and you know, autonomous vehicles, but also into the coastal areas where uh, accuracy is not necessarily as critical as being able to collect the data. Uh, and most recently, the last three years, we've developed this Solute Blue series. And so this is a much lower cost uh, and un less engineered sensor, which has really, really been geared towards laboratory and markets such as aquaculture. And that's been extremely successful as a result of doing that. So a little bit of science. I, I'm a scientist by, by trade and uh, certainly love to talk the science. So, we just give a few examples here of, uh, of some data uh, and some of the projects where some of our sensors have been involved. So this one I find really cool. You know, we've, the, the uh, Ocean Networks Canada has had a system of autonomous platforms that are tethered by cable to shore for continuous monitoring 24 seven, 365 days a year. And as a result, you know, they've been able to collect some tremendous data sets. Uh, and this one is in Cambridge Bay and it's under ice roughly 10 months of the year. So they're able to go and collect uh, equipment typically in the summertime, in around August. And that's sort of that window of opportunity when there's when it's ice free. Uh, and here you can sort of look at your typical CO2 and oxygen. So oxygen in blue and CO2 in green. So as the ice starts to build up uh, into the winter time, your CO2 increases as a result of respiration of organisms that are there. And as a result, as well, in conjunction with that, oxygen levels drop. And you should see a perfect mirror in these, and this is what you do see. In the periods when the water, there is no ice, things are much less stable. You have a lot more variability as a result of both uh, influx of uh, fresh water as well as uh, daylight, nighttime uh, cycles. So you see a lot more variation on short-term short cycles as a result of this. Uh, as I mentioned, our CO2 Pro atmosphere has become one of the 
one of our flagship sensors and the US OOI program is uh, one of the reasons for that. Uh, they purchased close to 30 of our sensors in order to have for just the wide swath of this program. I mean, you can see from the map itself, they, they've covered a pretty broad area all around North and South America with their, you know, with these buoy nodes, uh, in addition to AUVs and a lot of other equipment. These are the only ones where we actually have our sensors installed. Uh, and they've been able to collect some really, really useful data that's helping climate scientists as well as you know, people trying to understand carbon budgets and where carbon is coming from and where it's going. Uh, and so just an example of that, looking at, uh, just ignore the first period here, there were uh, really not sure what's going on there, but during this period, we're seeing in the atmosphere, roughly 400 parts per million or micro atmosphere CO2 with some really small scale variability through time, which is what we'd expect to see in most open ocean environments. The water, however, much more variable. So as we move through, uh, when you see the spring bloom, you typically see a huge drawdown in CO2. So what's going on during these periods in the spring and summer months is you're actually drawing CO2 from the atmosphere into the ocean. So the ocean is a sink of CO2 in this area nearly all year round, but most predominantly in the spring and summer months. Uh, there are other areas where you actually see CO2 being released, but in this area, you can certainly constrain how much carbon per year is being sequestered into the ocean as a result of uh, this. So the mini CO2, uh, really compact and certainly a lot more uses uh, right across the board. So we've had divers use these here because they're small and compact. We've also integrated these onto several different autonomous vehicles. Uh, these have options for internal batteries to be completely autonomous as well as to 6,000 meter steps. Uh, just put out there our mini total dissolved gas pressure. So total dissolved gas pressure is one of these sort of lesser known parameters. Uh, and it's what, what we started on. And one of the reasons for measuring this is looking to decouple physical processes in the surface ocean from the biological processes. Uh, if you measure oxygen and total gas pressure, you can calculate nitrogen, a relatively inert gas. Uh, this inert gas uh, will change as a result of physical processes, but not biological. And so if you're measuring nitrogen, you can understand those physical processes and how they're changing. And you can use that to correct your biological signal of oxygen from that nitrogen measurement. Uh, and just lastly, I'll just follow, I'll just uh, end on our solute blue sensors. So our most recent sensors and uh, really been one of these areas that's provided a lot of growth in the last three years for us. Uh, we've had methane and total gas for a range of things, including aquaculture and laboratory use, wastewater, groundwater, uh, and things like you know, just monitoring anaerobic processes, uh, as well as hydroelectric dams uh, for fish health. And the CO2 applications, the aquaculture hands down has been the biggest market for us over the last three years as far as growth. Uh, a lot of that's, this coming from Norway and, and looking predominantly at well boats. So these boats actually transport huge volume of fish that are being transported from open pens to processing plants. Uh, but at the end of the day, those fish need to remain alive and you want to be able to maximize your biomass to water in these uh, when you do that. But to do that, you have to have very tight controls on your monitoring uh, and be able to alter things as you go. So monitoring CO2 uh, continuously in these systems has been tremendously valuable to that community. Uh, and so I'll just end it there with a thanks. and. Uh, at the end of the day, all of this can't be possible and ProChance can't be successful without the support of everybody in our team. So I just want to give a shout out to all of them. Uh, so thank you. That's great, Mark. Um, that is a fascinating overview of the history of the company and, uh, and then some of the products you guys are working on is, is, is quite interesting as well. Um, what do you see uh, looking forward, the trends that are going to be most influential as a pro Oceanus? Absolutely. So with, with the current pandemic, it's always an uncertainty when 
uh, you're dealing with soft research funds and whether or not those will continue. Uh, so that's something we're certainly, we do have a concern about, but uh, you know, that's why we have branched out and pivoted to other markets like aquaculture, which provides a very stable base. Uh, but it also allows us to be able to continue our research and to develop the next round of products during any downturn. And this is uh, what we've traditionally done is, you know, when, when things, you know, we see a little bit of a slowdown, it gives us an opportunity to catch up on some of the research that we're doing. So uh, we're currently working on quite a few new products and, uh, you know, we're looking forward to be able to share those with the community, hopefully in the very near future. Well, that's interesting. And then industry side of things, uh, is aquaculture still going to be a, the, the big growth industry for the company, you think, looking forward? Absolutely. I mean, right now, a lot of our focus has been in Norway. Uh, and clearly, yes, they are the dominant you know, player when it comes to aquaculture. But uh, we have a lot more growth to be had in, in the aquaculture group. And uh, it's certainly something that we continue to see year over year. Uh, and it's, you know, that's, that's really our most active area in trying to grow. Uh, but clearly on the oceanographic side and oceanographic research, uh, we know once we have some of these new products out that uh, we're going to see a tremendous turnaround in that area as well. Uh, not necessarily a turnaround, but more or less be able to grow much more substantially than we have uh, in the last year or so. Interesting. That is uh, interesting aspect, kind of uh, uh, your different industries, um, uh, well positioned for, for growth. And, uh, I really thank you for, for sharing all that insight because, uh, your products, uh, from what I hear from customers and people in the industry, um, uh, we, we kind of called this whole session precision matters because it really does. And uh, what you enable is, is really powerful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kyle. I said, it's been a pleasure to, uh, to have the opportunity to come on here today and just, uh, sort of explain a little bit about what we do because uh, I know it's been very enjoyable to watch and to listen to everybody else so far and uh, to learn a little bit more about, you know, possibly a colleague who's literally one desk over who we should know more about than we probably do in some cases. We actually just had a late question pop in here from the audience and uh, we had showed uh, open ocean, uh, a pen based aquaculture. Are you seeing, seeing a similar type trends happening in uh, the land base, the, the, the RAS systems? So the RAS base is where we see most growth and that's much more similar to say a well boat and live transport. Uh, in these cases, you have a really high biomass and very little water. So you need very tight controls on your systems to ensure that the fish stay healthy. Uh, in a lot of cases on the RAS side, it's about improved efficiencies. And so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if they can reduce how much they're, they're degassing their system to remove CO2, which is a toxic, becomes toxic to the fish in high levels, then, you know, these systems are costly to run. So even if they can reduce their load on these systems by 5%, uh, it's a huge cost saving for these these groups. So the RAS side is where we see more more activity than open pen now. But as the open pen are moving to new ways, whether they're semi enclosed or in some of the treatment stages where they're actually covering these pens over during these treatment stages, that's where we're seeing a lot more interest in you know more more well defined monitoring programs for these particular systems. Interesting. That is uh, uh, a good look ahead to to, uh, to to big trends in the industry as a whole. So that should position you guys well for, for some growth for the future. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Um, have a great, uh, great week. And uh, we're going to uh, jump into trivia. I don't know if we want to stay around um, and uh, try to win some, some Cove swag, but uh, thanks very much. I'm going to put you now as an attendee uh, and uh, wow. Feel free to hang in and uh, uh, join and watch for our next guest. Wonderful. Okay. Oh. This always works in practice, but um, here we go. This 
Just waiting on our next guest, who is uh, Bruce Stover. Here he is, joining us from uh, Dartmouth, I believe. Yep. <laughs> hey, Bruce. How you doing? I'm in the Burnside office today. Perfect. Fantastic. Just before we start, I'm actually going to do a, a little bit of trivia and uh, and give away some some nice Cove merchandise for those who have been patient enough and uh, to join us today. So um, these are quite easy. So uh, I, I like just giving away free stuff. And uh, um, uh, in terms of sea life and activity below the ocean, uh, which ocean is the most active um, based off of that? Just leave your comments. Uh, in the chat, whoever replies back first, I will um, hook them up with a, a very nice Cove bottle. <laughs> if you need multiple choice, there's the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, the Indian Ocean. What's one of those three? Perfect. Uh, Bruce Batstone is the... Uh, the champion of trivia all the time. And uh, here he is again with a, another win. <laughs> uh, and then a, another easy one, um, Bruce, you can't play this time, uh, is which ocean is the largest? Perfect. The answer, the answer again is the Pacific Ocean. So Petra is the winner. And I, I did get a comment saying that there's only one ocean and I agree, but um, we're keeping this easy and simple. So I'm very excited to uh, jump in and, and and chat with our second guest today for Tenet Talks, uh, someone who I've, I've known for the last few years and uh, have really admired the work that they're doing. Uh, Bruce Stover is uh, with P Precise Design. Uh, welcome, Bruce. Or, sorry, welcome. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Excited to talk about the business and excited with everything that's going Fantastic. on. Fantastic. So, um, awesome. That's great to hear. I'm, we are having a little bit of a, a lag issue. I think it's through Zoom. So, um, just bear with us here. But uh, we can jump right in, and perhaps you can tell me a little bit more about your background. Uh, what led you to, uh, to uh, Precise Design? and a little bit about the company's history. Sure. So my background, uh, I've started as a CNC machinist in the early 90s and came through a couple different shops. Um, uh, very, a very large shop in town called Advanced Precision. I used to, uh, came up through as a CNC machinist and uh, eventually was vice president of Advanced uh, Precision Machining. Uh, we grew that company during that time from 12 to 90 people, um, but uh, at 90 people, it uh, turned into more of an HR job than, uh, than a, a, a machining job or even being able to concentrate on what I enjoyed with working with customers at grassroots uh, stages. So, um, so in 2009, uh, we formalized uh, recognizing that I needed to make a personal change uh, with my, my future. Um, and try and identify what I enjoyed. And that was working with customers at early, early startup stages and per prototype stages and working with problem solving. And uh, there was a disconnect uh, that we kind of followed up on that uh, didn't seem to be in the market at that time. Um, so we started Precise Design and with the intent uh, to try to eliminate the finger pointing exercise between design machining or manufacturing and the customers when there's a problem. Um, I'll be the last one to tell you that uh, we, we won't have problems. That's part of any prototype stage and prototype design, but our, our goal is to get the design done quick, get the prototype done quick, and then uh, actually get to the problem solving stage and uh, figure out what those problems are quickly so we can get on to the next stages and position customers, customers further. So, and that was, that was 2009. So, that's kind of how we how we started, um, and started with four people at that time. So, so since since then, uh, nice. and I, uh, from what I can see, the, the main premise of the whole company is boils down to those relationships. 
relationships have been key um, and that's part of the reason why we've apologies uh, there is some lag there okay um, the, the relationships have been uh, have been key for precise design uh, we're, we're big on face-to-face -face, uh, face-to-face meetings uh, we're big on having customers into our space but also being involved with uh, with their projects uh, on site if, if uh, the opportunity uh, is there um, and that's part of the reason for the three locations and part of why we're such a big believer in what's happening at Cove. Um, we, uh, the whole idea with our Cove facility is that customers can walk over and talk to our people at any time. And, uh, also why we've taken another office in the, uh, in the, the other building. So we can have more, more people and more, more reach with both, both, uh, buildings at Cove. So. Uh, I can go, I'll maybe talk to, to the three locations a little bit. Um, the three locations, uh, we've got one at Cove. Uh, the largest one is in Burnside. Uh, we've got about, uh, I guess we're at about 10,000 square feet right now in Burnside. Uh, and then we've also got a 4,000 square foot facility in Moncton, New Brunswick. Um, that gives us some geographical reach into, uh, into New Brunswick as well. And uh, the reason for New Brunswick was we, we had a customer base. We had customers coming to us out of New Brunswick. Um, and with our, the way we do business is we want to be able to visit these people, customers. We want to be able to get inside, see what they're having problems with and hopefully provide solutions. So um, with, the three, with the three companies now, we're running seven CNC machines uh, that uh, we, we run seven days a week in Burnside. And we run multiple shifts in Burnside, and uh, we hope to do the same in the other locations as we as we grow. So we've got added capacity there that we can uh, can add as as need be. Um, but the whole the whole concept starts with the mechanical design or an idea. The customer customer comes through uh, can be uh, anything from as simple as something sketched on a napkin or something that's very well thought out with uh, intellectual property um, that they need to get to market. Um, and that can be anything from, uh, obviously Ocean Tech is, has been big, really big for precise design and our customers, but we also are spread over defense, uh, Ocean, uh, Ocean Tech, defense, aerospace, uh, geoscience, um, a lot of high-end industry. So. Um, so our, our customers are the experts and we, we position their ideas to try to get them to market and, uh, make them robust and go into some pretty harsh environments. So, um, there, did you want to pull up the, uh, fantastic. The Let's jump into the, uh, the presentation now, if you want. Sure. I've probably talked to some of that already that <laughs> we might fast track through some of it, but, uh, go ahead. Perfect. I will, uh, you should be able to see the screen now. Okay. So yeah, the whole goal, uh, mechanical expertise, driving product success. We start with an idea with our customers and one of the big advantages to our group, uh, is the understanding about manufacturing machining and making things real. Um, and this is key, uh, at the prototype stage because it, it drives, the prototype, but also future. So um, those mechanical designs that we bring to the table, we're thinking about manufacturing. We're trying to get solutions that will position our customers farther with uh, manufacturing abilities that we know that we can bring to the table or our supply chain can bring to the table. So uh, we're trying to do that quickly. We're trying to eliminate uh, problems and and fast track these solutions. So we can go go to the next page. Um, so I don't. There we go. So a lot of times we'll start with uh, with our customer. We'll have initial meetings, sit down, go over what the ideas are. Um, kick around, kick around what they envision um, because we don't want to reinvent the wheel for them. We want to position them. 
we want to position them with their with their vision of where this product can go. So we'll have an initial concept meeting. Um, we'll we'll come up with a path forward. Uh, usually, quote the project that after that uh, after that conceptual meeting. Um, and then if everything is okay, we proceed to the design. Um, at that time, um, all, of our, all of our locations, our people work together. Uh, incredible group of people with varied backgrounds um, from engineering to machining to industrial design, uh, mold making. Um, and uh, we bring that team together at that point. It's incredible what they can, what they can develop. Um, so we'll go through a 3D design uh, we are running SolidWorks um, at all locations, um, and we'll we'll develop the 3D models. Um, at the end of that, we'll present it to the customer. Um, there's always feedback. Uh, there's always feedback, and we'll we'll usually take that uh, feedback and and do a do the modifications as required. Um, this sketch on the screen is a very simple model, but uh, can define most of our design to builds. Um, it, they are they are efficient. They cover the problem. They cover the modifications, and we're usually producing fairly quickly. So, for a simple chart, it defines the process real well. So, if we can go on to the next stage. So the capabilities and what our team can bring to the table, we've, we've, we tend to fall into the category of machining and I, I can do that myself because of my background in CNC machining and whatnot. Um, this company has been built off the design, the design component and uh, the mechanical design component of our team with the background that we've got in manufacturing tools, um, in manufacturing equipment, uh, in ocean tech uh, products, uh, and I mean, that's defense products, geoscience projects. Uh, we bring all that expertise into every, every new build we do. Um, the machine, the CNC shop complements what we're doing. Um, the ability to walk out on the shop floor and talk to a CNC machinist and ask them questions about details as we're designing is incredible. Um, and now we've also added uh, a 3D printer at Cove, um, so we hope to uh, we hope hope that's going to add a add a benefit to the Cove facility as well as and help our help our designs, but uh, also help Cove as well. Um, but we've got seven seven CNC machines between the three locations. Um, we'll concentrate on small batch volumes, prototypes through the day, and. During our back shifts and our weekends, we'll switch into uh, producing these products long term, and uh, we'll run the production production during the evening and night shifts, and concentrate on prototyping through the day. Um, the thing that really sets us aside is being able to put the full package together. Uh, so we can do every any one of these stages for any customer, but uh, there's several customers that we do all the stages. We do the design, we do the build. Uh, we do the machine manufacturing machining and then we assemble it um so we've got the full assembly shop uh that we've uh, just currently taken over a new space of about 3,000 square feet and we're hoping to grow grow the assembly area as well so from the mechanical design to the 3d printing to the cnc machining to our subcontract base and then the final assembly um, that kind of gives us a bit of an idea of uh, the capability of what this little shop can do. So uh, we can go on to the next next page. So with the, and this kind of covers off a lot of the industries, but uh, in no particular order here, um, processing equipment, uh, we've got large uh, pieces that we do for industrial manufacturing our industrial applications that we work on. Uh, geoscience has been, in, been an industry we've seen, uh, seen success in. Ocean technology is, has been uh, huge, huge in our growth and uh, what we're able to participate in. Bioscience and defense has always been an aspect. Uh, the defense industries have always been uh, a direct client uh, 
that um, has been a, a big industry for us. So uh, we can go on to the next uh, next page. So one of the other things that we can bring to the table, we are a Pelican uh, distributor. Um, with the Pelican cases, anybody can sell, you can sell Pelican. We're, usually what we bring to the table is a value add. Uh, we've got several cases that we do full assemblies with uh, um, that'll be built up with electronics. Uh, we've also got cases that we'll, we do a lot in custom, uh, custom packaging um, for our customers. So uh, let's say you've got a $10,000 Ocean Tech in, uh, instrument. Um, you don't want to send that to your customer in a cardboard box. So we've got different uh, solutions we can offer with uh, the Pelican product, but also doing custom inserts, foam inserts, uh, custom layouts that will add your cables, connectors, hydrophones, whatever the tools that would go with that kit. And then we also have the ability to add, uh, you can kind of see a bit of a demo in the, uh, in the screen, but we've got different overlays that can go over that foam. Uh, and that'll cover off uh, in, anything from labeling to instructions, to hazards, to, to just general part inventory with the, with the overlays. So, so the Pelican is kind of a neat uh, value added service that we add and uh, we ended up doing it because we felt a lot of our kits when they were done needed to be needed to be packaged and shipped uh, with something a lot better than a cardboard box. So, um, all right, we can go on to the next page. So this is just kind of a recap. There are some odd, oddball products in the background from some of the machining to some of the different materials and products that we do. Um, I, I wanna stress the, the customers we work for are all high, I'm gonna call them high tech, uh, high tech companies. Um, very, very skilled, very, very specialized and come to us. They are an expert in their field. There's no question. and. Uh, our, our role here is to take that expertise, that uh, division, that um, their ideas and position them, position them in something that's uh, gonna facilitate that vision. And a lot of times that is, is making something robust. A lot of times it's uh, making it so it'll, I mean, whether it goes underwater to 5,000 meters or whether it goes to the middle of the desert and needs to operate in extreme temperature and not be affected by dust. It's, uh, we see every aspect of, uh, of, of that in a design. So, um, and we also try to bring a unique look and feel to every customer, uh, whether it's color, we can do simple things with colors, labels, overlays, Profiles. Um, there's there's things that make uh, make our customers unique, and we try to we try to add little details in that their products uh, the products can be reflected in that. So, okay, go ahead. So there's just a little snapshot, uh, kind of shows a little, a little extreme from anything from uh, odd, odd shape underwater enclosures to uh, uh, marketing devices with the, uh, the biometric VR, VR device uh, that went all, all over, went, went into the States and different, uh, different parks. And we've got uh, pictures on the far right of industrial uh, industrial fridge uh, coffee machines that dispense five cup, cups of coffee at a time for healthcare and, and uh, mass food production. Um, but then you also see in the bottom left, bottom left corner, you see devices that weigh a couple thousand pounds and get mounted to the front end of an excavator. So um, we can, I, I always say, you never know what's walking through, what projects walking through our front door uh, any given day. And, uh, it never fails to amaze me the ideas and and opportunities that our customers uh, can bring to us and look for look for ways to uh, produce them and get them to market. So, uh, 
Okay, we can go on to the next page. So that's just an address. And I think Kyle, you were talking about maybe passing all this information out, but that's just an idea where the three locations are and, and a nice, nice shot of cove on the tail end of it. So um, one, of the, one of the things I haven't talked to at this point, um, but needs should be a priority maybe is the materials that we work with. Uh, we, due to the industries we're involved with, we're working with a lot of plastics, a lot of uh, higher end materials, I'm going to, titaniums and uh, stainless steels, aluminums. Uh, we're doing very, very little in the mild steel just because of where our markets are. Um, everything tends to be a wash down or uh, ship environment or underwater and uh, with those environments, it, it's all, all tends to be high end, high end materials um, in all three of our shops. We probably do maybe 1% mild steel, um, which is kind of odd for, for manufacturing and, and machine shops. But uh, anyway, it's it, some of the materials we can offer uh, get quite unique. Uh, we've got uh, custom enclosure materials that use a composite to try to eliminate uh, using materials such as aluminum uh, and even eliminating stainless steels if we can. Uh, the composites, the composites uh, minimize some of the effects of the uh, deteriorated uh, the corrosion corrosion issues and uh, we've had we've had good success with with a lot of those products uh, for the underwater and the ocean tech markets so um, so so the column is what's what's next on the agenda No worries. Thanks, Bruce. That was a great overview of kind of the whole operations, and uh, perhaps we can we can chat about some trends because I remember when we were talking in our, our systems check, uh, you had talked a little bit about COVID nineteen, uh, kind of the pandemic. But your team is already well distributed anyway. You're in three offices. You work well together remotely. Um, can you kind of uh, tell us a little bit of an update how things may uh, look right now and how your company can help out in some of those spaces? So COVID-19 has been a, a very interesting uh, time period for any business to navigate. Uh, with the three locations, we've been very fortunate that uh, we are considered essential service with manufacturing, but that brings on other, uh, has brought on other challenges with the, uh, uh, obviously the cleaning, the extra cleaning, the, uh, the antibacterial gels and things uh, it's so we've we've taken on a lot of those challenges uh, we've early on we had several people working from home uh, we've we've now brought transitioned everybody back uh, back to the shop floor uh, at all three locations but we've got uh, very large facilities and uh, are well well distributed so uh, we don't have anybody working uh, working very close to, to anybody else um, as a company, we took the uh, period of time through COVID to uh, actually uh, uh, actually invest in our future and take advantage of what we saw might be a turmoil, a bit of a turmoil in the market and a slowdown. Uh, we've actually invested, uh, I mentioned the 3D printer. Um, so there's an Ultimaker uh, 5S Pro 3D printer that's sitting in front and center in, the, uh, in our code space. Um, that we've invested in are uh, quite excited and what that's going to do for our team and quick results on being able to get objects in their hands to fit print circuit boards and connectors and make sure that uh, we're moving forward uh, before we're wasting machine time on on actual builds. Uh, so the 3D printer's been, uh, been one of the aspects we've added at Cove. Uh, we also invested in a robotic cell. Um, we bought a, bought a system for Burnside and that is a 35 kg uh, Fanuc robot cell um, for loading loading one of our machines. Uh, at 35 kg, we're we're going to be able to uh, we're going to be able to throw around some pretty big pieces into into our machines. Um, the ability there is that uh, 
we do run Burnside facility seven days a week and we do run multiple shifts, but with the robot now, we can have a machine set up and you're, our, our people are incredible, but there's time that I'm interrupting them to ask them questions that machine sits. There's, there's times that people are being pulled away from machines for various reasons. Um, so this is a way that uh, we can allow our people to do other things and monitor the machine and the robot, but gain gain an efficiency for ourselves. But that uh, actually helps our customer base as well with uh, more efficient turnarounds um, and uh, hopefully savings for everybody in the long term. So uh, we're also going to be adding a four inch bar feed to that machine. Um, so we don't have to introduce the sock kite operations. So we've taken on COVID uh, with a large investment and trying to take advantage of any downturn in time that we've seen. Uh, we've been very fortunate that we're all, we're, we're still working um, and still moving forward and uh, hoping to come out at the other end of COVID a stronger company uh, with more capabilities. So. What's what's the next question? Thanks, Bruce. We, we do have a question coming in from the audience. Um, uh, when a customer comes to you uh, with a product, uh, so, yeah, when, a, uh, when a, a customer comes to you with a, a project idea, what's an ideal project look like to you and your team? I'm guessing it probably is an intricate um, uh, relationship building exercise, but also uh, maybe a new product that is, is new to the market that um, you might be interested in, I'm guessing. So it's a great question. Um, we, uh, we tend to be particular, <laughs> we're, we're a particular bunch, but uh, we, we listen to every uh, project proposal or, or customer meeting um, and we need to make sure it's a fit, number one for our customer, but also, also our group. Um, we, we can run into different situations that uh, we definitely want to work with everybody's ideas, but if we've got a closed off relationship that they're not open to suggestions or open to options, um, we're probably not the right fit. And uh, so the project base, I, I can't stress enough uh, how varied they can be. Um, and, and even geographically, we've got work going on all over, I mean, in North America, UK, uh, across Canada. So even location doesn't matter. Um, it's really a big fit with communications. It is a fit on our comfort level with the project if we feel that we can add value. If not, we, we do have a very honest group um, that can probably work for us and against us at times, but uh, we, will, we will hear every project and we will think about them and uh, come back that uh, this, this, we do see this being a fit for precise design and, and the company or I'm sorry, this probably isn't a great fit for precise design at this time. And, uh, and not to say that we can't review it in the future, but uh, it's got to make sense for everybody or it, it fails epically. And I'd rather have that conversation up front <laughs> instead of after the fact. So yeah. hopefully that answered the question. Awesome. That's great. Um, so we're, we're, out, we're at time now. And I just want to say thank you very much, Bruce, for joining. It was a great conversation. And uh, I'm sure people learned a lot about precise design. Thank, thanks for having me. Uh, it's uh, been great to be in a uh, part of Cove. And uh, we we've, we've value that relationship at Cove. And I can't, can't stress how important that has been uh, uh, for precise design and being able to plan plan our future and COVID is very de definitely a big part of our future and uh, thanks for being having us and being a part of it so thank you Perfect. I uh, just want to apologize again for the, uh, the, the audio issues. There was a, a desync issue, I think, on, on Zoom for uh, uh, myself. It didn't happen with Mark, so, uh, but Bruce, you were uh, the guinea pig for why I got to figure out how this works. And uh, everybody who's watching, I just want to say uh, thank you very much for joining. And 
a happy World Oceans Week. Uh, next week, we're back with another episode of Tenet Talks. We're back to one episode per week. Uh, we're on Tuesday, uh, June 16th. Um, I'm meeting with Arnold Furlong with Dartmouth Ocean Technologies and uh, very excited to do that. So thank you again for tuning in. And thank you, Bruce and Mark, for, for being such uh, amazing guests and learning more about your companies. Thank you.